Welcome back to Man vs. Meeple, the show where we talk about all things board game related. We are back with another Kickstarter preview. It is for a game called The City of Kings by a brand new designer, Frank West, and a company called The City of Games. Yes. And this is a worker placement cooperative fantasy adventure game that has a heavy dose <laughs> of influence from video games that we've played in the past. Yeah, absolutely. And a heavy dose of components. This is <laughs> a, a lot of stuff on the table. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's not that complicated. It mm. looks more complicated than it is. One of the cool things about this game is it kind of tells you how to play as you play it, too. Absolutely. So... Here's the story behind the game. The Vesh, which are the bad people in the game, have attacked uh, this this overworld, and all the leaders of these factions have come together to protect one particular city from getting destroyed. If it gets destroyed, game over, everybody right. loses. So all these races and factions are cooperating uh, together in order to beat story-driven uh, scenarios. Now, there's two ways to play the game. Now, we've only played the story-driven game. Each of the stories comes with a stack of cards that not only tells you how to set it up, but how the story progresses right. through the game. And there's seven uh, different stories. But also, Frank just announced a couple of days ago to us that there's also going to be just flat-out scenarios, which are shorter 45-minute to an hour games that people can jump in, play through a scenario, and be done, and not have to go through the story, which typically lasts about two and a half hours to get yeah, through. Yeah, the story can, t can last uh, about two and a half hours yeah. or shorter. The cool thing about the stories, too, is a lot of people would think you... You know, once you do a story, is there any point to doing it again? The interesting thing is there's a really good narrative in the story, but the way the game works yeah. is that it's so variable and changes every time. The way you're flipping tiles, the mm -hmm. way the monsters are built, yeah, it makes it fresh every single time for sure. Yeah, it's very, it, it's completely variable and modular by the way that you set up uh, the game itself. Now, the characters themselves. Let's start there because there's a lot of components. We'll go through them each in order. The characters are very, very cool. They're very, uh, I want to say the word Diablo-esque uh, in the way that you build them up. They do it's, feel that it's way. It's almost like a character tree in which you can uh, develop your character in very specific ways throughout yeah, and, the course of the and game. And across the board, too. I mean, there's the, the base stats yeah. that you're going to be able to adjust as everyone levels up. So... As you get experience, the whole group gets experience, and then everyone decides how they're going to spend their points. And then on top of that, like you said, there's the skill tree, which yeah. is very much like Diablo, I feel. Yeah. And it's there's an amazing amount of options here on the skill tree for each character. So, so let me talk about these boards uh, briefly, if I can. <laughs> so on the left-hand side, you have a skill tree. And as David alluded to, you're going to build up the screen, uh, skill tree from Tier 1 all up to all the way up to Tier 3. You'll be gaining skills as you progress in the story by typically either killing monsters or doing very particular yeah. quests that you would go on. Uh, over here you have equipment. Equipment comes in four different things. You have legs, body, head, and arms. But you could only equip certain equipment by having particular levels on your health and your primary stats, which are your attack and your heal. Right. So at the very beginning of the game, you can equip any legs and any body that you so wish, but you can only equip uh, arms and head once you progress a specific... Uh, in certain stats. In certain stats. Uh, at the beginning, uh, you have a health. Uh, you have a maximum health, which is denoted by a red cube on your player board, and then your current health, which is denoted by the player color that you right. currently have. Everyone starts at four health. You also have an attack. Everyone starts at one attack and one heal, meaning that on your turn you can attack for one damage and you can heal yourself or another character that is in proximity to you for one health. You also have range, movement, and luck. Everyone starts at one range, two movement, and zero luck. <laughs> no luck. Range is how far you can attack. Movement is how far your character can move on the player board. And luck is a die that you'll be able to roll to modify uh, certain attributes in the game. And what's interesting about those statistics in particular is each of them have two levels. Yeah. So to go through, you know, to get two movement, you're going to have to go up two levels of level one. So yeah. it's like 1A, 1B, if you will, and then level two, so on and so forth. So it takes a little bit longer to progress up those to get what you're wanting. Now, this is another cool part. You don't just have a character. You also have workers. Yeah. So you have some worker placement style Real-time strategy yep, game totally stuff real -time going on strategy. In, in this. You have one worker that you start with, which is denoted by a little player disc. It looks like a wagon, right? Yeah. And you'll be sending your worker out onto the board collecting resources. You also have a secondary worker that stays on your player board 
that won't be opened up until you get to a certain area in the game, right? right? I mean, you have to progress and open that up. So if anytime any of your workers, now this is a completely different track. Your character has movement, your character has abilities, and your workers also have three attributes that are directed to them. They have a movement, a gather, and a scavenge. Yeah. And those allow them to move on the board and then to get resources by using dice when they're in particular locations on the board. Yeah, and this, this, like we said, it's like a real-time strategy game. And what we mean by that is not real-time in terms of board game playing. Yeah. Uh, real-time in terms of, like, old Warcraft games, yeah. Command and Conquer. Right. Because you're basically, on your turn, deciding, okay, I'm going to use some of my action points for my hero. Mm-hmm. You're going to use some of your action points for your workers. It's a cooperative game, so Jeremy might be going out, building up his attack, taking on creatures, exploring with his hero... I might be focusing a little bit more on taking my workers out and mm-hmm. gathering up the resources and spending my points when we level up with my workers instead of my hero because then I can become sort of like a master gatherer. Uh, before we get into how the, the actions work, let's talk about the board. In the left bottom hand corner, you have the city board, and this is where all the players will start, including one worker from each of the players. On the board, you have a hope track, which goes up to 10, and you have a morale track, which starts at 3 and will work down to 0. Both of those two items will work uh, back down to 0. The players cooperatively lose all hope, (laughs) players lose. And if at any time the players lose all their morale, they lose. Now, hope is lost in a day cycle. Once a full day passes, they lose one hope. Right. And there's ways of gaining hope through completing story tasks. Morale is lost whenever a character dies. Uh, death is not permanent in the game. If you die, you're going to resurrect back in the City of Kings, and you'll be able to re, uh, you know, redistribute right. and go back out into the world. Uh, on the bottom portion of the board, you have a track that denotes your experience. Experience is communal. This is a great portion about the game. Yeah, love that. Yeah, the communal experience is great because in a lot of these games I've played in the past, you know, one player, even if you're cooperating, one Mm -hmm. player starts leveling up because they're doing this and that. You're not leveling up so much. In this one, everyone's leveling up up at the same time. It's just up to you to decide how you want to level up. It feeds also into the cooperative aspect of the game, right? Everybody wants to contribute in whatever way they can to leveling up because each of these level ups allow you to do possibly one of two different things. Either move an attribute up, and you get to pick whichever attribute you want to move up. So, for instance, you can move your attack or your health. There's also ones in here that move your skill tree up, which allow you to gain new skills. Right. Now, the skill tree is really neat. You are going to start with, uh, the first time you place onto the skill tree, you're going to place it on a bottom row of any one of these uh, actions. Now, each of these actions uh, correlate to one of the particular symbols that you see on your attributes. Right. When you build and you gain more skills, you have to connect to an adjacent location. And then on the left and the right-hand sides are abilities like permanent abilities that you get throughout the course of the game. Yeah, and very unique to each type of character. And that's that's where it's like, it's a mix of increasing your attributes even more, like you said, or do you go out and get some of these special powers that could potentially benefit you in a, in a fight? Yeah, and there's passive and active right. uh, special abilities. When you get up to one of the top rows, you actually go out and find a new skill tree, and you'll add it as a card, which will unlock new abilities and possibly even new uh, skills for yeah, and, that player. And those are sitting out. There's four, five, four of them sitting face up on the table. Those are the ones you're going to be able to select from. So... As you're playing the game, you can always look there and go, oh, okay, there's a lot of health on that one, or there's a lot of luck. I want to go this route. That one has an ability. Mm -hmm. A lot of different flavor there. Again, this game, after just a few rounds, you really start to feel like get into a groove of what your character's doing compared to what your teammates' characters are doing. Right. Uh, The board is modular, and as you'll notice on this story card that you see here, it tells you how to set up the board. Each time that you play, it's going to be different compared if you're playing a particular story or if you're playing a particular scenario. It'll tell you which tiles to use, and there's a variety of different tiles in there. You have your green tiles, which are your more simple Uh, easier to conquer tiles, and you have your red tiles, which are more difficult, bring out harder monsters. Right. Um, But they also have different abilities. On these tiles, you have areas, you have locations, you have places that spawn creatures, you have places that provide markets for people to buy um, 
the equipment pieces that they need. You have places that you can go on quests. There's a giant stack of quests that players can go on. They, those quests require them to go to particular locations on the board or kill particular monsters in a particular way that allow you to gain skill points or experience. And I really and so feel forth. like this game wants you to explore all those options. Yep. Because it feels like, like we said earlier, it's like a video game RPG in many, many ways. And if you don't do quests, for instance, like, well, the first time we played, we kind of just stayed on the track of the main objective, yep. going through the story. And then we realized we may have wanted to do some quests in almost kind of a grinding sort of way, to yeah. use another video game term, so that you can spend a little bit more time and grow your characters a little bit more because we went into the red area <laughs> yeah. a little too soon yeah. and completely got obliterated. Yeah. Let's talk about the creatures. The creatures are unique. Um, now, there is no... I say unique in, in the wrong kind of way because there's no unique <laughs> creatures in the game, but each of the creatures is represented by a tile, and these tiles are completely generic, but they have all different kinds of facings to them. Right. And a, each time you fight a creature, uh, you'll see a number on the back. They come out in a progressively harder state. And they have a whole list of stats on the bottom, including their health, how much damage they do, if they do area of effect, um, and how much experience um, that they provide when killed. The unique portion about the creatures is this. When a creature spawns, each of them will get a particular attribute, either a easy, medium, or hard, or multiples of those depending upon the designation on the actual tile. For instance, this one has a little green mark. I know it's hard to see, but you're going to draw one green tile. Also, some of the locations on the board where they spawn will also generate right. tiles for those characters. So you're going to go over to the bag, whichever bag it's telling you to draw from, and you're going to grab that many attributes randomly from the bag. This spawns a very unique creature for oh, that experience. Extraordinarily unique, there's, especially if there's multiple tiles. There's 50 different abilities yeah, that they abilities, have. Yeah, abilities, the monster abilities. So there is an entire book about the abilities that the monsters have, and there are things like laying fire down, laying area effect fire down, freezing people. Yeah, and like I said earlier, you don't have to read through that entire book before you play this game. Yeah. In fact, part of the fun, in my opinion, of playing this game the first few times was pulling those tiles out, building the creature, and then saying, what do these do? <laughs> and then we look in the book, and that may sound like a drag to some people, but in this game, it feels so good, because you're looking in the book and like, oh my gosh, wait until you hear what this creature can do. It's explained to everybody, and then you have to deal with it, much like a boss monster, again, in a video game, because they're very unique once those tiles get applied to them. So, how does a turn structure work? Let's walk through a typical turn. It's pretty simple. Um, at the very start of the round, you're going to resolve whatever it says on the story card. Right. Some of them tell you to do particular things. You're going to move the time tracker. Uh, this is the time tracker in the game, and it always starts at midnight, and it always moves one space uh, clockwise. Whenever it reaches midnight again, the entire team loses one hope. Uh, again, players are going to start with three hope as ways to gain hope. The other cool thing about this time tracker is you'll note different kinds of... Uh, like status ability, status yeah. effects. Right, so you have freeze, fire, and poison. It during the course of the game, certain spells rec will create fire tokens on the board, or, or uh, you'll be poisoned. poison. Yes. Whenever these markers hit that location, they either go away if they're a small piece of poison, or if they're a large poison token, they get flipped to the yeah, small. Diminish. And then when they get the poison again, they go away. Yeah. It's a really cool way of denoting how status effects. Uh, will hurt players and when the status effects will go away. Yeah, it's really cool the way they've done this because it not only does that, but it's it's built around that entire mechanism of losing hope as well. So you really start to pay attention to this, particularly when a lot of effects come out. Uh, the third thing that happens is that the players get a player turn. And the player turn works like this. The first thing that happens is they do any impairments that are on them. So if they have, like you said, poison yeah. or fire, those things take effect. The creatures that are attached to those particular characters will attack. Uh, you, so you'll do a combat, and then you get player actions. This is very Eclipse-like. Uh, at the start of the game, each player will have four tokens that they're allowed to use to do player actions. On the bottom uh, right-hand portion of the board, there's a whole set of different actions that they can take. Some of them they can do multiple times. Yeah. So, for instance, they can move, they can explore, which is exploring new locations on the board. They can attack or heal. They can take special abilities, which are denoted on the skill tree. Some of them say special, which will allow them to use there. Or they can interact with a tile, like doing a quest or buying equipment right. from, an, from a merchant. 
Also, there's places for your workers. There's a worker one and a worker two spot, and each of those locations have two actions that they can take. So it's completely up to the player how they wish to spend those four action points. Right. You can put them all on your workers. Yeah. Uh, you could put them all on your heroes. It's interesting because you'll find very quickly why you need to increase some of your attributes because with your hero, there's only one option to move. Yeah. So if you you have a move of one uh, or two at the beginning of the game, yeah. If you if you ever want to move more than that, you're going to have to increase that attribute yep. because you're never going to take two move actions with your hero. Right. There's also a way to increase the number of uh, actions you get. That's by unlocking your fifth wor- or your second worker, who it also adds a fifth uh, right. action for the players. And you're just going to keep doing that round and round until the game is over. Now. Combat. Let's talk briefly about combat. Combat works like this. Um, it's There's no dice, which is right. fantastic. It's all dependent upon your attributes and the skills that you, that you have unlocked for that character. Uh, each of the monsters has their own attributes, so they will tell you exactly how much damage they do to players if they have area of effect um, and how much range they have. All yeah. the combat in the game is orthogonal, so if you're at a corner tile, it's a great strategy to hide in corners or to hide in opposite locations so they can't hit you. Uh, monsters also have, some of them also have movement, so they will be moving around the board. Some of them don't have movement, they're just stationary. Yeah, they basically have really interesting AI built yeah. into each of them, and like I said earlier, that AI is built out of the tiles that get placed on them. Mm-hmm. And you're looking in the book, and there are cards when they move. There are cards that you'll flip over to determine how they're going to move, mm-hmm. depending on the current situation. It really makes it... Feel, you, you get a lot of flavor from the way those monsters operate, for sure. Uh, one more thing I want to touch in before we start talking about our feelings about the game are the workers again. When your workers go out, I, I love this portion... It, your workers will collect resources and they will compile on that player board. There's six spots on your player board for each worker in which they can put resources. You can't use the resources right then. The resources actually have to be brought back to the City of Kings, so they have to make it all the way back to the city, and then they get deposited in something called the Old Barn, which is a communal location right. that anybody can pull resources from. So again, it really, really ties into the aspect of players building out their characters in very particular ways, and one player taking on the role of workers, and one player's, or one or two players taking on the role of being either a healer or an active attacker in right. the game, um, or, or along those lines. Yeah, the, the interesting thing, too, about the barn, too, is you're going to be bringing things back, so you can't go out and load up. Like Jeremy said, you only have six spots on your worker, mm-hmm. so you have to bring that back pretty religiously. <laughs> and this is where the, the resource gathering is where the dice do come into play, yeah. which is unique. So there's no dice in combat, but there are dice during uh, gathering. So you'll go to a tile, you'll roll these dice, and some of these dice will even have, so they'll have numbers that d- dictate what how much of a resource you get to pick up, right. but they also have some monster icons on them. And once enough monster icons get added to a certain tile, a random monster will be generated. Yeah. Not by the tile itself, but by the fact that you've dug a little too deep yeah. on that tile. Yeah, I love that aspect. It forces players to go to other locations on the board to gather Right, because you'll look down and you'll see some monster tokens. You're like, I'm not getting wood again yeah. because we might have a monster and we already have two out. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I gotta say, there's a lot going on in this game. There is. Um, I really like it, though. I, I love the aspect that it's taken uh, a game like Diablo and it's make it in, made it into a board game format that is approachable for players. Absolutely. If, if, if you, by any chance, are a fan of either Diablo and or Warcraft, the original one, yeah. I can't imagine <laughs> you not loving this game because yeah. it's, it, it really distills those experiences together. Yeah. That whole worker aspect and the hero aspect really feels like Frank must have been a, uh, a fan, for sure. A- absolutely. <laughs> uh, the game will ship uh, with six unique characters. All of them have unique skill trees uh, attached on them. We have posters down here that you guys can see all of them. Um, there's also some, some additions that were just recently made, David. Uh, your workers can actually be used to build barricades now. They can use oh. to be built traps. There's like barricades that are one-time effects depending upon the level of the group. So if you're a level 8 and you build a level 8 barricade, that blocks 8 points of damage coming again, into a character. And the, again, the cool thing about this is you listen to all this and you think, oh, that's a lot of details to keep track of. Someone's going to have to be basically like a dungeon master level experience here. 
But really, the way this game plays, you're just able to reference what you need to know yeah. and know it when you need when you need to know it. Yeah, I mean, the rule book, even just the rules in general, uh, it's only like a 22-page rule book, and yeah. most of those are pictures. I mean, right. a lot of examples. So it's not a hard game to learn at all. I really like it. Yeah, it's a very, very smart design. Uh, I'm interested to play. We've only played a f- like we've, we've only played one story. One of the story scenarios. Yeah. That's what they had available. So very interested to see how different stories uh, occur. And then down the road with this game, I could see you know treating it as a whole campaign for sure. Yeah, if Ray could mention that the story that we have played is very much about just attacking, building up your characters, and attacking one boss monster at the end. Uh, he's saying there's ones that are going to be resource driven, collecting enough resources huh. to bring back to the city of Kings. There's ones where you're going to have to develop your characters in a very specific way to achieve like mastery in a skill. A whole bunch of different styles, the, the ways that you know you can approach this, the story. Yeah, it should be noted itself. right right now the way the game is built. You're going whenever you play, you're going to start with a fresh character. So mm-hmm. your character, it's not like a legacy game, yeah, where you're building up your character and using that character over and over. But it's a nice way to get in and have a a unique experience. Plus, I think that allows you to take it with different groups Mm -hmm. and play it so that you're not all, you know, you don't have to get one group that's committed to playing this over a long period of time. So, guys, that is The City of Kings by The City of Games. (laughs) Uh, Brand new publisher. Uh, Make sure you guys check it out on a Kickstarter if you enjoy it. If you enjoy these style of games or enjoy those video games that we had mentioned, give this one a shot. Yeah, definitely take a look. Uh, Make sure you guys subscribe to us. Make comments below. If you have any questions, please ask us. We'll ask the developer himself. Follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook and everything else that we do here at Man vs. Meeple. And we will catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.